Good evening. I'm Mark Syme, minister of the Northfield Church of Christ in Northfield, New Jersey. And these are the PM services uh, for the Northfield Church for Sunday, the 4th of July. Uh, we're singing from Songs of Faith and Praise. We will have four songs. We will observe the Lord's Supper. And hopefully the message that I bring will be uplifting to us and perhaps uh, send us off uh, this evening with something in mind that would be good. So if you would please, if you would turn your songbooks to number 580, 580, all three verses. <clears throat> The joy of the Lord is my strength. 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 He heals the brokenhearted and they cry no more. He heals the brokenhearted and they cry no more. He heals the brokenhearted and they cry no more. The joy of the Lord is my strength. He gives me living water and I thirst no more. He gives me living water and I thirst no more. He gives me living water and I thirst no more. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Very, very good. And if you would turn to number 202, that's 202. Joyful, joyful, we adore Thee, God of glory, Lord of love. Hearts unfold like flowers before Thee, opening to the sun above. Melt the clouds of sin and sadness, drive the dark of doubt away. Giver of immortal gladness, fill us with the light of day. All thy works with joy surround thee, earth and heaven reflect thy rays. Stars and angels sing around thee, center of unbroken praise. Field and forest, vale and mountain, flowery meadow, flashing sea. Chanting bird and flowing fountain, call us to rejoice in thee. Thou art giving and forgiving, ever blessing, ever blessed, wellspring of the joy of living, ocean depth of happy rest. Thou our Father, Christ our brother, all who live in love are thine. Teach us how to love each other, lift us to the joy divine. Mortals join the mighty chorus which the morning stars began. Father, love is reigning o'er us. Brother, love 
Albine's man, man to man, ever singing march we onward, victors in the midst of strife. Joyful music leads us sunward in the triumph song of life. Before we observe the Lord's Supper, uh, let's sing number 705. 705. Common love. A common love for each other, common gift to the Savior, a common bond holding us to the Lord. A common strength when we're weary, a common hope for tomorrow a common joy in the truth of God's Word. We are instructed to gather together on the first day of the week, and one of the uh, specific instructions is that we are to gather together on the first day of the week to break bread. We are to remember the death and the burial and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, it was a, a magnificent gift that God gave to us that Jesus would sacrifice himself one time for all. Um, as uh, in the Old Testament, uh, in the days of temple worship, we know that uh, the animals were sacrificed and these sacrifices were uh, uh, beautiful in the eyes of God, but uh, that sacrifice is not done anymore because uh, we don't have a series of high priests. We don't have a series of Pharisees or Sadducees. We have one Lord Jesus Christ, and he uh, lived on this earth, and he died one time, sacrificing his life for each one of us. And so as we gather about the Lord's table, we have two components of the supper. Uh, the bread, uh, and in that we're talking about the body that Jesus gave up for us, and the blood, the life-giving liquid represented by uh, the fruit of the vine that uh, uh, brings life to a whole body. And so as, as we remember the emblems, uh, let's first give thanks for the bread. Our God and Father, we're, we're so grateful that you had that magnificent plan. We're so grateful that Jesus was willing to leave his home on high, that he was willing to dwell among men and feel what all men feel. And uh, at this particular time, we're ever so grateful that he was willing to sacrifice himself, that we might have forgiveness of sins, and that we might have the opportunity for eternal life. As we partake of this bread, let's think of his body given up for us. We pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. pray for the cup. We're so grateful, dear Heavenly Father, that Jesus was willing to shed his innocent blood. And it is that blood, the blood of Jesus, that forgives our sins and washes them away. As the song says, there's power in the blood. And uh, we're so grateful for that power that's found there. And so as we drink this uh, uh, fruit of the vine, we're reminded of the blood that was shed for each one of us. Help us to be grateful and help us to be in awe of that. 
we pray it in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. Often when we come to the giving part of our service, it usually follows the Lord's Supper. It doesn't have to. There is not an order to when we are supposed to give. Uh, it seems to be a, a convenient time. And um, there, is, uh, there is some uh, interesting, uh, there's an interesting aspect to it though. Because we are giving, uh, we uh, dovetail that off of Jesus giving his life for each one of us. Uh, the giving, uh, in this case, is a monetary giving. It's a giving of how we have been prospered. It's a giving of uh, gratitude for what the Lord has done for us. In a, uh, uh, just a, uh, I don't exactly know how to uh, say the words, but uh, as uh, monies are given, we understand that uh, churches have buildings, uh, churches have programs, uh, churches try to reach out to, to others either locally or in foreign lands. And we know that the, the monies that people give go for the church working the way it needs to work so that uh, the gospel of Jesus can be spread. So let's give in a cheerful manner because this is what the Lord wants us to do. Let's pray. Our God and Heavenly Father, we're grateful that we have the ability to give. And we're grateful to Heavenly Father that uh, Jesus has set the example that he gave of himself. And now we are asked to give of the blessings that uh, we have. And we just pray that we will give with gratitude, that we will give with cheer, and the monies will be used to further your work, uh, both here in New Jersey and throughout the world. We pray this in his most holy name. Amen. <coughs> and the last song that we will sing is number 67. A beautiful song. There was no pun intended because the song is for the beauty of the earth. 67. For the beauty of the earth, for the beauty of the skies, for the love which from our birth over and around us lies Lord of all to Thee we raise This our sacrifice of praise For the beauty of each hour Of the day and of the night Hill and vale and tree and flower Sun and moon and stars of light Lord of all to Thee we raise This our sacrifice of praise for thy church that evermore left at holy hands above, offering upon every shore her pure sacrifice of love. Lord of all to Thee we raise This our sacrifice of praise 
great job. I hope you were able to sing along with us. And uh, I know the Lord is glorified in the praise of the song. Uh, I'm glad that we put our hearts uh, into uh, the song. If uh, you were there this morning, um, you know that the uh, lesson this evening is entitled, Let God Be True. Okay, let God be true. So, uh, where am I going with this? Uh, I've heard an old saying, you know, the Bible said it, uh, that says, well, I believe it, that settles it. Um, but there's more to all of this, uh, letting God be true, than meets the eye. So for just a few moments this evening, I'd like us to, uh, just to take a look at that, what it means to let God be true. In Romans chapter 3 and verse 4, the Apostle Paul says, Let God be true, <clears throat> but every man a liar. Our job here on earth is to lead godly lives. To lead a godly life, we must be able to distinguish right from wrong. We need to be able to discern between good and evil. And we're even supposed to be able to delineate between truth and falsehoods. And so we should never, ever uh, dismiss the words of God as they come forth to us from Hebrews chapter uh, 6 and verse 18, where it said, God cannot lie. It's a big responsibility on the part of human beings, isn't it? Uh, no one said that being a Christian was going to be easy. Uh, there are weighty aspects to being a Christian. And uh, some of those deal with understanding what's right and what's wrong, understanding what's good and what's evil. And the really tricky one and the tough one, and that is, being able to distinguish between the truths and the falsehoods. Throughout history, people have been led astray through falsehoods. They've caused uh, millions and millions of deaths following leaders who spread lies just to uh, gain fame, uh, just to gain power. Haven't, when we think about it, haven't we spent enough time listening to the, quote, experts. And the experts keep droning on and on, uh, sometimes saying less and less, while wasting more words in the process. The English philosopher Bertrand Russell, uh, he was a philosopher, mathematician, but uh, he was con considered to be an erudite man, said this, even when the experts all agree, they may well be mistaken. Right? Uh, that's not biblical, but it's close to being biblical. Jesus, in Matthew chapter 15, verse 14, said, If the blind leads the blind, both will fall into a ditch. We can almost insert truths and falsehoods, good and evil, right and wrong, into that. And that's what Jesus said. The, the blind, perhaps, are those that don't want to accept the truth, that those that don't want to accept the good, those that, um, you know, dismiss the mighty words of God, understanding that God never lies. And so, uh, listening to public opinion uh, is not always better, is it? Think about it for just a moment. How often has the majority led us down the wrong path? In Bible talk, uh, we can go all the way back to the flood. Since the days of the flood, how many people followed God 
a scant few. The majority went the wrong way. How about uh, the golden calf that was built when Moses went up into the mountain to uh, get the, the part of the law that would be given to the people? Um, where was the majority when the golden calf was being worshipped? Where were those stalwart people that said, whoa, Moses is our leader. Uh, God speaks through Moses. Yet the majority of the people wanted this idol made. How about Joshua and Caleb when uh, the spies went out uh, to view the land of Canaan and uh, the rest of the spies came back with a, a chilling report of uh, how many people there were and how big they were. The majority wanted not to go there because they were afraid. Yet just these two, Joshua and Caleb, uh, said, we can get victory here. We have that chance. When we get down to uh, the death of Jesus, uh, where was the majority when Pilate, the governor, uh, gave the people the opportunity to get off the hook, realizing that the man that was before him did nothing that deserved death, offered them a, uh, a thief by the name of Barabbas. Where was the majority? The majority said, crucify Jesus, give us Barabbas. Often, many, many times, both in our secular lives and in our religious lives, the majority has been on the wrong side of the issue. Let me read a, a rather poignant scripture for you from Exodus chapter 23 and verse 2. Listen to what it says. It says, You shall not follow the masses in doing evil, nor shall you testify in a dispute so as to turn aside after a multitude to, in order to pervert justice. It's what mobs are all about. How often are mobs right? More often, mobs are wrong in what they do. Yet, they come forward with this uh, strength. And because of it, people are willing to follow. The masses follow. The majority isn't always right. Now, how about in our country where we live? How about the lawmakers? Are they always right? Are the laws that are enacted always the right laws? You know, we're fortunate in this country to have a multi-party system in which people get to vote for uh, their leaders, both on local levels and on national levels. But it would seem that the political system has evolved into two major parties. Maybe <laughs> it can be said they have devolved into two major parties. How often do the parties fight against one another rather than taking into consideration what will be best for the people. They think along what we call party lines. Now, there are folks out there that may belong to one party, may belong to the other party, but this isn't the issue. Which party that one belongs to isn't the issue. Just because a thing is legal does not necessarily make it right because many times the reasons for making it legal 
are not really for the good of the people, but just for the good of the party. It gives us pause to think, doesn't it? For example, let's look at some of the laws throughout the Bible. In Daniel's day, when he was in captivity, it was unlawful to pray to God. Now, is that a great law? Because a ruler is talked into putting out a law which perhaps would make him look uh, elevated, uh, that does not make the law right. Daniel flaunted that law by, by praying and letting people know that he prayed. Our Lord was crucified because a group of Jewish leaders thought that they were upholding the law when indeed they were not. This was the majority the early first and second century church had literally thousands of Christians put to death because of the laws and the lawmakers of the time. We have genocide around the world. There have been terrible uh, different isolated genocides and they only happen because of laws that were enacted so that one group of people would always be made to look bad. Sometimes legality and priority are miles and miles and miles apart. And so what does the, the Bible actually say about this? Well, in Acts chapter 5, verse 29, when it comes to push and when it comes to shove, the Bible in Acts 5, 29 says, we ought to obey God rather than men. Now understand, we live in a society where there are laws. And by and large, um, the lawmakers try to make laws for the good of the people. And you know, many of them are good. Because a lawmaker makes them does not make them bad. I would give you our, our traffic laws, for example. The, the traffic lights, the red, the green, light system that tells us at intersections that we ought to wait and let the other people go by. Stop signs in certain areas having speed limit signs uh, adjudged by where this is and if it's in a residential area where there might be driveways and so forth the speed limit goes down and how about when we uh, go into an area where there is a school and in, when school is in session, very often there are lights blinking telling us that we should go uh, more slowly. And so there are laws that have been enacted and, and they are certainly in many cases uh, for our good. And so I don't want us to, to leave saying that just because laws are made, they're bad. There are even some of those, I don't know, borderline laws. How reluctant were people to wear seat belts while driving their cars? And it has been proven that if we wear seat belts, we have a better chance of surviving an accident. Well, you'll have somebody say, well, I wasn't wearing a seat belt. And the, and the EMT said, if I'd have been in a seat belt, I'd have died. That's an isolated example. By and large, the seat belts save lives. And, and we can go over and over. Unfortunately, people take out their cellular devices 
and think that they can text and drive at the same time, that they can look at Facebook uh, and or as some of the get on the, the social media and do that the same time that they're driving. There are laws against that. And by and large, those are new laws. And then there's another one. And that is, how about listening to our heart? That inward part of us that that tells us how we should act. Well, you know what? Sometimes our hearts can lead us astray because there may be some built-in prejudice in our hearts that would lead us to go down the wrong path. Now, there are two Old Testament scriptures that help us out with this. In Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 9, Jeremiah says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And then from the book of Proverbs, which has many, many wise sayings, in Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 12, the writer says, There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Jesus said, Not everyone that calls, says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Our heart might tell us to say, Lord, Lord, but if that is not followed up by positive action, those are just empty words. And so, as we complete this lesson this evening, what's the best and the wisest course for all of us to simply take? Well, I would recommend that the wisest course is taking the words that are found in God's holy and uh, spirit-inspired word. And we can start with the very first psalm. And there are some words in the first two verses of the first psalm that said, Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. Okay, the first part of the psalm tells us what to avoid. It says not to walk in the counsel of the ungodly, not to stand in the way of sinners, and finally not to sit in the seat of the scornful. But the book of Psalm, that next verse, puts it all in bold relief for each of us. And it says, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. Psalm chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. We have some place we can go. We can go to the Holy Spirit-inspired Word of God to find the truth, to find the way that we need to go. Let's make sure in our lives that we let God be true, that we understand that, that God will not lie, that Jesus lets us know that if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. Understand that the majority is not always right. And finally, understand that laws are enacted by men. And not all the time are the laws going to be the right laws. We need to delineate between what are the good ones and what are the bad ones. And of course, the wisest course is to shun evil, to not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, not to stand in the way of sinners, and not to sit in the seat of the scornful, but delight in the law of the Lord and meditate on it day and night. 
I hope that all of you um, have come to the Lord. I hope that all of you uh, have started your Christian walk. If you have not, we offer an invitation to you this evening. If you need to come to the Lord, if you understand that you need to confess Jesus as the Son of God, repent of your former ways, and be baptized for the remission of your sins to be reborn in the Lord, we want to encourage you to do so. If you need to do that this evening, just get on the phone and call one of us, and we will be ready uh, to help you. Uh, let's all pray together. Our God and Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that uh, you're our Lord, and we're so grateful that uh, you sent Jesus to us. We're so grateful, dear Heavenly Father, that uh, you are true, that you cannot lie, that in your Holy Spirit-inspired words are found the truths that we need to follow if we are going to lead the kind of lives that uh, we should lead. I pray, dear Heavenly Father, that you bless us this evening. Help us to meditate on the words that we've heard. Help us to uh, go to sleep with uh, God in our mind and wake up with God on our mind. Bless us through the evening. Help us to look forward to the next time that we meet again. And dear Heavenly Father, help us to be the godly people that you have called us to be. We pray this prayer in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. May God bless you all. As far as the east.